If you're the type of person who normally skips through to the start of podcasts, you might want to wait around for this announcement about a series of podcasts that I'm going to be making this week. Through the series so far, I have tried to bring the 1840s to life, and this week I'm taking that a step further. I'm packing up my laptop, microphone and camera, and heading to Ackill Island off the coast of County Mayo. Ackill is a really spectacular place. It faces out onto 3,000 miles of Atlantic Ocean. On Ackill, the 1840s is closer to the surface than in most parts of Ireland. The abandoned village of Shreve Moor gives you a sense of what life was like, even if it is eerily strange in its silence. Right now, a team of archaeologists, led by Dr Eve Campbell from the Ackle Archaeological Field School, are excavating another famine village at Kiel, and their discoveries are giving us unique insights into life during the famine, bringing these runes to life. While on Ackle, I will be making videos, short podcasts and doing interviews with the archaeologists. This once-off content will start being available on Patreon from Wednesday. If you're thinking of becoming a patron of this series, now is the time to do it. You'll get tons of bonus content this week alone, so you won't want to miss out. You can sign up today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's Patreon, P-A-T. R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Irish podcast and join me on what would be an incredible journey to the 1840s. Each week I take time to thank patrons who are the people that keeps this show on the road and allow me to make content like this. So this week I want to thank Tyler MacDonald, Alan Yu, Mike Mulvale, Katia Stauffer, Ollie Purcell, Eric Patterson, B. McDonough, Barbara Brady, Rich Sulla, Deborah Bowen, Catherine Crossman and Richard Sparrett. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is The Valley of the Shadow of Death, The Great Famine Part 8. Over the past few episodes we have seen a major food crisis develop in Ireland since the failure of the potato crop in 1845. In this podcast the situation explodes into a full-blown famine. By the end of the episode, we will find ourselves in what can only be described as the Valley of the Shadow of Death. But unlike the biblical proverb, Irish people had every reason to fear what was coming. To begin though, we start with what has become a regular feature of the series, an individual account from the 1840s. This one focuses on an early story of emigration. It's a little longer than most have been, but it's a really fascinating account, so I felt it was worth including all the details. The role that geography and nature plays in the story of our past is often overlooked. The history of Killala Bay in County Mayo is one such place where the landscape and natural environment have played a central role in its history. Enclosed by Lena Doon Point to the east, and down Patrick Head, 20 kilometres to the west, it's one of the few accessible bays along the north coast of Mayo. There are few other places to access the interior of the county. As you travel west from Killala Bay past down Patrick Head, the coastline of Mayo is stunning, forming much of the tourist trail, the wild Atlantic Way. However, once you leave Killala behind you, the land is also inhospitable, unwelcoming and frequently inaccessible from the sea. At Keda, for example, the land lies 400 feet above the shoreline on cliffs that tower above the sea. Stunning as this is, it has ensured that Kalala Bay has staged much of Mayo's recent history, given it's one of the few places ships can berth. Whether it was trade, invading armies or people seeking to leave, much of the history of this part of the world has been telescoped into the confines of the bay. In 1798, a fleet of ships from the newly established French Republic dropped anchor here, carrying a valuable cargo, military support for Irish rebels, who rose in revolt against British rule that summer. While they were defeated, the story of that rebellion is covered in part one of the series. 48 years later, in the summer of 1846, hundreds from across Mayo made a lonesome journey to the waters of the same Killala Bay. Theirs, however, was a one-way trip. Having endured nearly a year of major food shortages and still several months away from the coming harvest, 
these people had taken the fateful decision to leave Mayo and Ireland for good and seek a better life elsewhere. Few, if any, would ever return. The arrival of a ship, the Elizabeth and Sarah, in the bay, had offered them the chance of a fresh start in Canada, and unsurprisingly hundreds who could afford the cost of the passage across the Atlantic were willing to take it. However, these people were not pioneers by any means. Long before the failure of the potato crop in 1845, emigration had been a feature of life in Ireland, particularly the West. Between 1800 and 1845, somewhere in the region of 1.5 million people had left Ireland, with most travelling to the United States and Canada. But unbeknownst to these people, gathering on the shores of Kalala Bay in the summer of 1846, they were the first ripples of what would become a tidal wave of emigration from Ireland that would change the English-speaking world. Indeed, the voyage of the ship Elizabeth and Sarah was not only the start of a massive wave of famine emigrants, but its passengers were also among the earliest to endure a transatlantic crossing in what would become known as a coffin ship. This term, coffin ship, refers to the unbearable conditions on board the vessel. The Elizabeth and Sarah, about to embark on a transatlantic voyage, certainly had seen better days. It was almost 80 years old in 1846. The keel had been laid in the shipyards of Newcastle in the north of England back in 1762. To make matters worse, the captain, Jeremiah Tyndall, was keen to maximise his return on the upcoming voyage, even if it compromised safety. The ship was due to depart on May 1st, but the Elizabeth and Sarah did not leave Killala Bay for another three weeks, a move which, as we will see, had dire consequences. The captain, Tyndall, had waited and waited, cramming the vessel with more passengers until it was way over capacity. By the time it finally dropped anchor on May the 26th, Tyndall had managed to get an extra 55 people on board. For the passengers, it was undoubtedly a moving moment as the ship rounded down Patrick Head and faced out into the Atlantic. Ireland vanished behind them, and as one passenger later remembered, they bid adieu to their native land. However, their aspirations for a better future were soured by what proved to be a terrifying experience while crossing the Atlantic. The vessel was not able for the increased numbers on board. The Elizabeth and Sarah had only 36 berths, four of which were taken by the crew, leaving only 32 for the 276 passengers on board. That's an average of around nine people in each berth. No food was provided for the emigrants. They had to bring their own. But, given the captain had delayed over three weeks in Kalala before departing, food was running short long before they reached North America. After three weeks, the passengers who had been rationing what little they had up to this point were finally told the vessel had arrived at the banks of Newfoundland and were nearing their final destination of Quebec. Relieved that they would at any moment spot the coastline of North America, they no longer rationed their supplies. However, the crew, whether through inexperience or error, were completely incorrect and the Elizabeth and Sarah was at sea for another 24 days. Food quickly ran extremely short and many had none. There was a terrible irony that these people who had boarded this ship to escape the hunger back in Ireland were now starving to death in the Atlantic. To make matters worse, the water had turned putrid, being described by some of the passengers as gluey. Inevitably, disease broke out and the crew, themselves sick, ran the ship aground on a reef at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. While they managed to get the vessel afloat again, the captain and several other passengers died from disease, leading to a horrific conclusion to the voyage when the remaining crew handled this situation disastrously. Those that died on board ship were buried at sea. In the 19th century, there was nowhere to store a body. While the dead passengers were buried in this manner, for some reason the crew insisted on keeping the corpse of the captain on board the already overcrowded vessel. One of the passengers later recalled what became a disturbing and disgusting reality on this ship. For 13 long days the body lay in the quarter deck in the most horrid state of decomposition, thereby engendering the pestilence among us to a fearful extent. Eventually, 
the Elizabeth and Sarah, after suffering further damage, was towed into Quebec City. After 72 days at sea, the survivors were given medical attention, although more still died. Horrific as this transatlantic voyage may have been, by the time these emigrants, who had departed Kalala Bay in May, made landfall in North America in August 1846, there was little doubt that they had made the right choice. Back in Ireland by this point, hundreds of thousands would have taken the option were it open to them. In the late summer of 1846, the crisis on the island was magnifying at a terrifying rate. When the Elizabeth and Sarah had left, the British government had just opened their food depots on May the 15th, and while the food they offered was little more than enough to survive, the prospect of the upcoming harvest gave many hope that the end of the crisis was now in sight. However, as the vessel was towed up the St. Lawrence River into Quebec City and the travails of the passengers were coming to an end, millions back home in Ireland were facing starvation on a level previously unimaginable. To understand this, we will next meet one of the most famous men of the age, the Capuchin priest for the Theobald Matthew. By 1846, Father Theobald Matthew had achieved what many would have regarded as impossible in the 19th century, or for that matter, at any point in Ireland's history. He had spearheaded a movement that had campaigned against alcoholism in Irish society by asking Irish people not only to cut back on their drinking, but to abstain from it completely. And on top of that, he had been pretty successful. Hundreds of thousands had taken a religious pledge to this effect and Father Matthew became a household name across Ireland. He was something of a sensation, with many believing the man to have supernatural powers. The respect Father Matthew garnered even crossed the deep political divides of the day. While Irish peasants revered him, British political representatives held him in high esteem as well, a feat achieved by few in Irish society. The British authorities were happy that he had kept his temperance movement removed from politics and he refused to be drawn into the debate around the Act of Union which had seen political tensions rise across the island. In the first year of the famine, Father Matthew had shied away from getting involved in relief work on any large scale and continued to focus his energies on his crusade against alcohol. However, by the late summer of 1846, as the passengers of the Elizabeth and Sarah made landfall in Canada, he could no longer avoid the topic because what was unfolding in Ireland was truly nightmarish and hard to imagine in the 21st century. The best way I can describe this is through Father Matthew's own words. On August the 10th, 1846, as a respected member of Irish society, he wrote to Charles Trevelyan, the chief civil servant and the man responsible for administering famine relief in Ireland, outlining what was happening to the potato crop? On the 27th of July last, I passed from Cork to Dublin, and this doomed plant bloomed in all luxuriance of an abundant harvest. Returning on the 3rd of August, I beheld with sorrow the waste of putrefying vegetation. In many cases, the wretched people were seated on the fences of their decaying gardens, wringing their hands and wailing bitterly of the destruction that had left them foodless. In this journey over around 200 miles from Dublin to Cork, Father Matthew had seen that the blight which had destroyed 30% of the potato crop in 1845 had returned. While this had been known since at least mid-July, the extent of what Father Matthew outlined was truly terrifying. For me the description of the wretched people, as he calls them, wringing their hands and wailing bitterly, says it all. The blight was spreading across the entire island as early as August, given it was appearing a month earlier than it had in 1845, it was clear that it would now wipe out the entire crop in the summer of 1846. It was unstoppable. This meant that the food of three to four million people was about to disappear. Clearly a crisis of epic proportions was unfolding, and to make matters worse, the British government's relief operations, which had been rolled out to address the shortages resulting from the harvest of 1845, were due to be wound up on August the 15th. They had chosen this date as they assumed the harvest of 1846 would be available to feed the people. 
However, this was clearly not going to happen now, and something needed to be done, and fast. However, perverse as it sounds, there were many with influence in Ireland and Britain who were not only reticent to continue providing food for the starving, but were now actively urging the government not to import any more or intervene directly. Father Matthew continued in his letter describing this situation. It is not to harrow your benevolent feelings, dear Mr Trevelyan, I tell this tale of woe, no, but to excite your sympathy on behalf of our miserable peasantry. It is rumoured that the capitalists in the corn and flour trade are endeavouring to induce the government not to protect the people from famine, but to leave them at their mercy. I consider this a cruel and unjustifiable interference. This was a reference to the free trade lobby, which did not want the government to import food in 1846 like they had in 1845, in fear that it would lower the price of food in general. Instead, even though the situation was far worse than it had been in 1845, these merchants wanted the government to stay out of the market completely. Indeed, some of the grain traders were even threatening that if the government started to import food into Ireland, they would refuse to sell grain on Irish markets. While it might sound like these men were blackmailing the British government, this doesn't really explain the dynamic at play. The politicians in London completely agreed with the arguments of this free trade lobby and did not need any convincing to implement their views. Many members of the cabinet were among the main proponents of free trade in Britain. In this context, the appeals of Father Matthew, an Irish priest, over merchants in England or Ireland would struggle to be heard when they came into conflict with the views of men like Charles Trevelyan himself or more importantly his political master in the treasury Charles Wood, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. There is no denying that the situation facing the Liberal government and the Prime Minister Lord John Russell were grave indeed with around 90% of potatoes in Ireland destroyed by the blight millions now faced imminent starvation. However, challenging as this was, they did not need to reinvent the wheel to solve the crisis. There was already a blueprint of sorts in existence showing them how to alleviate the unfolding famine. The previous year, the former Prime Minister Robert Peel had imported Indian maize, which had prevented widespread starvation. Now, for this to work in 1846, the government would need to import vast amounts of food in comparison to the previous year. But if they engaged in a massive grain purchasing operation from August 1846, there's no denying it would have a major impact. Each ship that arrived in Irish ports would save hundreds, maybe thousands of lives. In what seems like an almost inexplicable move, the British government, however, announced that they would not only not increase the amount of grain being imported into Ireland, but that they were going to stop it completely. The passage of 170 years makes this no less outraging. So we have to ask, why on earth would they do this? First of all, we can dismiss any idea that they were ignorant as to the extent of the situation. There was no doubt that they were well aware from an early stage that the blight of 1846 was far worse. In response to a question from the Irish MP Daniel O'Connell, the Chief Secretary for Ireland, Henry Labouchere, who sat in the British Cabinet, informed the House of Commons on July the 23rd that the disease has unfortunately made its appearance and feared that there was every prospect of its spreading to a serious extent. So there's no doubt that the government were aware. On August the 17th, they addressed the House of Commons, unveiling their plans to deal with this crisis, and this confirmed what was in retrospect a jaw-dropping plan, but the details of it revealed their motives. The Prime Minister, Lord John Russell, who replaced Robert Peel a few months earlier, was well aware of the situation himself, as I've said, and he made this clear when he spoke to the House of Commons on August the 17th, and read out a letter from Lord Enniskillen, the Grand Master of the Orange Order. It is my painful duty to write to you on the state of the country of Fermanagh and of that part of the county of Cavan which borders upon it, till within the last three weeks the potato crop was promising but the disease has since broken out in it with such violence and so universally that there is no prospect of a potato in the county at Christmas. The Prime Minister, John Russell, then seemed to offer a glimpse of hope when he went on to say, It is imperative 
that government and parliament take extraordinary measures. However, the hope lasted all of about 10 minutes. Because after he sat down in the House of Commons, Charles Wood, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, took the floor. He got into detail about what they were planning and bluntly stated, It is not the intention at all to import food for the use of the people of Ireland. While there were some small exceptions to this, which I will return to later, this was nothing short of devastating. The main thing that had staved off famine in 1845 were imports of food organised at the behest of Robert Peel. Charles Wood finally then revealed his reasons, which were the very thing Father Theobald Matthew had been fearful of when he wrote to Charles Trevelyan a few days previously. That is, that the capitalists in the corn trade were exacting huge influence on the government. Charles Wood himself said that merchants had declared they would not import food at all if it were the intention of the government to do so. Wood then said he had every reason to hope that the food of the people would be provided. These words, every reason to hope, was not enough when the lives of as many as three or four million people were on the line. These grain traders had no obligation to Ireland, so leaving it up to them alone was dangerous to say the least, given their bottom line was profit. What Irish people needed were certainties, perhaps a commitment from Wood that the British government was going to start buying food immediately and importing it. This sadly was not going to happen. The Liberal Party, in accordance with their ideological views, was going to put their trust and the fate of millions in the hands of the market. However, there were problems that even ideologues in London could not ignore. For a market to function, people need money to buy goods. But many Irish people simply had none. Something had to be done about this. This was where Russell was talking about taking extraordinary action. He and his government planned a large scheme of public works which would employ hundreds of thousands eventually and would allow the poor to buy food. However, like any scheme, the devil was in the detail and the word devil is certainly apt in this case. By the middle of 1846, there was no denying the full extent of the blight in Ireland. More or less the entire potato crop was as good as lost and Ireland now faced a famine on a level previously unknown, perhaps in Europe, in living memory. However, the Liberal government had made it utterly clear they had no intention of importing food on a large scale. Planners led by Charles Trevelyan in London were drawing up details far removed from the reality of life on the ground. The first stage of this plan was to proceed as planned and end the system of distributing grain that had been established by Robert Peel in the aftermath of the potato failure in 1845. This was due to happen on and after August the 15th. They also planned to cease a limited programme of public works which had provided employment and more importantly money over the previous year as well. Once these programmes had been wound down, they then planned to launch a much larger system of public works, which they envisaged would give the poor money to buy food. However, from the get-go, this plan was pretty disastrous. Charles Trevelyan, the leading civil servant in the Treasury, one of the primary architects of this plan, had banked on there being breathing space between when he wound up the relief schemes of 1845 and when people would desperately need food in the later months of 1846. He assumed that at least some of the crop of 1846 would be available to tide people over. However, with the near total destruction of the crop in August 1846, many people had no food whatsoever and the situation quickly became desperate once the 1845 relief programmes were closed down in late August. By September that year, widespread and serious starvation was setting in. The Kerry Evening Post reported with an air of desperation from Corcogyne, an area many of you will know as the Ring of Kerry. The potato crop is gone in Corcogyne. Oats have also suffered. Starvation is staring us in the face. The ill-advised suspension of public works at this moment is fast clenching our misfortunes. God only knows what can be done to provide food and employment for the destitute labouring classes of this barony. However, it's worth pointing out that not everyone was starving. Class was, by and large, the determining factor. The report continued from this popular part of Kerry, which was, even then, a tourist attraction. The hotels here are crowded with tourists, enjoying the magnificent and romantic beauties of our western scenery. 
Lord and Lady Ventry are entertaining at Burnham House her ladyship's sister, Lady O'Donnell O'Hara, and family. However, alongside this, millions stared into a future without food or hope. By mid-September, the British government's new famine relief strategy was coming online. But overall, it was far from convincing. They launched a vast scheme of public works to provide employment. And I say launch because where they were organising it, the British government had no intention of paying for it in the long term. The public works that the Liberal government believed would see Ireland through the winter of 1846 and into 1847 were designed along the lines advocated by Charles Trevelyan. Now, if you want to know more about him, he is a key figure in the famine and I have done a full podcast on his life, which is available on Patreon now at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Public works had been carried out on a limited scale in 1845, but the system was completely overhauled for the winter of 1846 when it was relaunched. Before I detail these changes, I should say public works were essentially large employment schemes that usually involved building roads, bridges, harbours, in short, pretty heavy work. One of the most notorious aspects of the 1846 overhaul of these schemes was the funding. Trevelyan time and again stated his view that if the British government funded widespread famine relief, they would end up having to pay for millions of Irish people on a long-term basis. In 1845, the Treasury had shouldered half the cost of famine relief in Ireland, which Trevelyan had been opposed to. However, the new Liberal government held similar views to his line of thinking, believing ultimately Irish landlords should be the ones to foot the bill. The mantra of the day became, Irish property must support Irish poverty. And in August 1846, the government rushed a bill through Parliament to this effect. However, in the 1840s, this was akin to wringing blood from a stone. Many landlords simply didn't have the money, or at least enough money, to fund famine relief. Now that said, collecting what monies were available was a lengthy process, so the government did offer upfront loans to cover the cost of works in advance, but these were only given out at 3.5% interest. There were also very careful regulations on how public works functioned, and they were far more stringent than previous programmes. From 1846 onwards, the starving poor working on these schemes were not paid by the day. Instead, the ideologically consumed liberals and civil servants like Trevelyan in the Treasury introduced a performance-based system. This was really perverse. We're talking about giving money to starving people facing famine, but the Liberal government were concerned that if wages were paid on a daily basis, it would encourage idleness. In any case, the wages offered were too small, ranging from 8 pence to 1 shilling and 6 pence a day. These meant that many labourers were not able to feed their families as the government refused to interfere with the market and the rising price of food. By the end of 1846, someone working on these programmes six days a week, earning 1 shilling a day, could feed a family of four children about two pounds of Indian maize each day. This was less than one kilo between six people, if we include two parents. These were literally starvation wages. Even aside from this, getting the public work system up and running was laced with problems, some of them of the government's making. A given region could apply to have works carried out in their area, and as early as August, applications began to flood in to the Board of Works in Dublin. However, in what was typical bureaucracy of the entire famine period, the application process was not exactly streamlined. When a given region applied to have works carried out, this application was sent to the Board of Works. They then asked for further information before engineers would be sent out to survey the proposed site. Meanwhile, the starving people had to wait. While more staff were needed, the near obsession with control and detail, not to mention the constant belief that the starving poor would scam the government if allowed to, led to an extraordinary bloating of the public works bureaucracy. Eventually, there were over 15,000 people employed, while the 74 engineers and 558 assistant engineers were necessary, the nearly 10,000 overseers and 4,085 clerks, which cost over £400,000, may have been excessive. As Ireland faced into a starving winter in late 1846 and early 1847, It was terrifying to think that millions now depended on these works to survive. 
The government's refusal to import food was essentially using Irish lives in an experiment to see how the market would operate in a famine situation. The one exception to this, which I mentioned earlier, was in the far west, where there were few big ports and merchants operated on a very limited scale. It was obvious that the market could not and would not provide food here. While the government did agree to import food, they stipulated that it had to be purchased within the United Kingdom. In this way, they were not as such involved in importing and exporting, but more moving food around the United Kingdom, which Ireland was then part of. Under these conditions, buying even a fraction of what was needed proved difficult. Bearings, who carried out the purchases of Indian maids in 1845, refused to try, saying the conditions set by the government were simply too extreme. They said it was not possible to buy the grain needed in the United Kingdom. Now this should have sounded alarm bells, but it didn't. The unenviable task fell to other traders, Ericsson's. However, as Bearings predicted, it was an impossible task. 1846 was the first of several years of extreme shortages all across Northern Europe and the UK markets could not supply the food needed in Ireland. Ericsson's were struggling to buy food at any price by late September. When eventually this was acknowledged and the government gave them permission to buy on the international market, it was too late. The corn season was coming to a close and other European governments had bought up large stocks and orders placed in the USA would take months to arrive. Had they started buying in July or even August, when they had been aware of the impending crisis, it would have helped, if not completely staved off, starvation. A truly terrible winter was now on the way. In some areas, people who had been able to survive on wild vegetables, fruits and what was called gleanings, the collection of what was left after the harvest, were now beginning to go hungry. As the last weeks of August passed and the daylight ebbed away, this natural resource was available less and less. Even in spite of this, the government insisted that if they so wanted, Irish merchants could still export food. And while the level of exports did decline in 1846, many merchants continued to ship food out of the country. While the amount of grain being exported fell from 514,000 tonnes in 1845 to 285,000 tonnes in 1846, this was still a hell of a lot of food and could literally have saved lives. So, to conclude this episode, I want to ask a question. Could the British government have done anything different in the late summer and autumn of 1846 to have an impact on the unfolding situation? In short, the answer is... Yes. First and foremost, we can say the British government did not make any attempt to make up the shortfall of food outside the extreme West. And even there, they imposed constraints on themselves, which made their attempts futile. It is worth pointing out that it is doubtful whether they could have imported enough food to stop everyone starving, but it would have made a massive difference. The more controversial issue is this issue of exports. A ban on exports for the entire duration of the famine from 1845 to 1852 would have been counterproductive and probably would have made the situation even worse because the economy would have collapsed. However, this is not to say closing the ports temporarily would not have worked. Even though there was a dramatic fall off in exports in late 1846, a complete ban on the export of grain for a few months between late 1846 and 1847, as suggested by the historian James Donnelly, could have saved thousands and thousands of lives and probably would not have done any long-term damage to the Irish economy. Nevertheless, this is all counterfactual. The British government did not intervene on this level and had no intention of doing so. They were adamant the system they had put in place would remain. The plans drawn up in London were far removed from the reality of Irish poverty, so the crisis only got worse and worse. As exports continued, the price of food continued to rise from September to early November. Starvation set in on a massive scale. Millions were now on an island where their access to food was controlled by the market, and they were increasingly unable to buy food in that market. Life began to ebb from Irish society. In the coming episodes, we will follow the story into 1847, a year remembered as Black 47. The next episode, though, will be on a slightly different tack. As I said, I will be recording in Ackle Island in the west of Ireland, 
which will give you a good sense of what life was like at the time and we will get to look at the fascinating findings of the Ackle Archaeological Field School. You can find out more about that on patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Until then, Sloan.